We're all set to have a new chairwoman, and we tell you why treasuries are important. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show, folks. I am David Hansen, normally joined by Matt Kopenheffer, but he is in Senegal or some African coastal country. Matt's so, somewhere in Africa. So I'm joined by Morgan Housel, a Fool One analyst now. You are now in-house, no longer just a writer for us. That's right. Got a busy day of headlines. Let's throw up the first one. Got to start with Janet Yellen, of course, from the Wall Street Journal. Yellen is Obama's choice as Fed chief. Not a huge surprise here, right? Yeah, I mean, this was already priced in by the market. We've known it for several weeks since Larry Summers bowed out of the race about four or five weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It was, it was pretty much assured that Janet Yellen was going to get the nod. And it's almost certain, I think, uh, that she will be confirmed by Congress as well. Although, do, although who knows what yeah, Congress we'll is going to do. Right, do, you think, do you think that this was, I mean, Summers pulled his name out, what, three weeks ago? Do you Something think like the that, administration yeah. was kind of holding on to this? The market's been down a couple of percentage points. Hey, let's, let's give them something they like. Let's give them Yellen. You know, the, the consensus, I remember several weeks ago, before we were talking about the government shutdown, when everyone was still focused on, on on who was going to run the Fed. Mm -hmm. The consensus was that the White House was going to was going to announce it around October 1st. So maybe okay. this is a little delayed, but they've had other stuff on their plate the last couple of days, obviously. Right. So. All right, moving on to the second headline of the day. We got this one from Market Watch. Congress posing grave risk to U.S. economy, mortgage banker chief says. So we're talking about the shutdown, the debt ceiling. The Mortgage Bankers Association presidents come out and said, hey, this is going to start to have an effect on the housing market. Sure because of IRS income verification, people not having their, their paychecks coming in that are federal employees. Do you see this as kind of just a blip on the radar in the long-term economics of the supply and demand housing market that's gonna win out? Or is something like this, could that really pose a grave risk to the housing market? Right now, the government shutdown is a blip on the radar. I, I think it will affect the housing market in the short run. You know, the, the single largest variable that drives housing, very obviously, is people's incomes. Mm -hmm. If you lay off 800,000 government workers, that's going to pose some, somewhat of a problem in the short run. And then, as you mentioned, there are things with income verifications. There are, you know, a huge portion, effectively mm -hmm. all of the residential mortgage market is government controlled in one way or another. Uh, so yeah, when you start throwing wrenches in that system, it's going to throw down. It's going it, to it's going to slow things down a little bit. Mm -hmm. In the long run, as you said, it really comes down to the the supply and demand of household formation, the strength of the economy. If if we were to not raise the debt ceiling and default on treasuries sometime in the next couple mm -hmm. weeks, that would have a very substantial long-term impact on the housing market. Mainly because its potential effect on mortgage rates, right? On interest rates, right. right. You know, if interest rates rise because the economy is growing faster, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. If interest rates rise because the market is putting in uh, a risk premium on it because right. they're more dangerous now, we don't know if the government's going to pay back, that's a bad thing, and that will slow down the economy. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, but going on to our final headline, this one is from The New Yorker, Why America Needs a stock market crash, and in this post, John Cassidy's saying that with all this indecision in Washington, we need the stock market to go down a couple of percentage points here, and that'll really be the impetus for them to actually make a decision. Is this something that, does, do you really think that would work? Yeah, I think that absolutely would work. And something that John Cassidy talks about in this article is he goes back to October 2008, mm -hmm. uh, when, the, when Congress and the Fed uh, were, were debating the TARP bank bailout program. And at its first pass in Congress, when they were voting on TARP, Congress voted it down. They said, mm -hmm. no, we're not, gonna do, we're, we're not gonna do TARP. Immediately, within seconds, the Dow fell 800 points. Mm -hmm. uh, th uh, that day, I think it closed down 777 points, which was one of the worst days in history. Congress got the message, uh, and, they, and they went back and, and, and passed it. So yeah, I, I, you know, I think whenever you're in these negotiating situations, coming up to a point where there's, where there's an obvious uh, downside mm -hmm. and there's, there's some heat under their rear ends to get things done, that's what, what really pushes people. Yeah, you, you talk about the potential for a crash, though. I, I think it's, it's important to put it in perspective. Say the market drops 10% which 10% over a course of three days, let's say, that would be pretty huge. I think people would be running around with their, like their heads cut off. But even if the market goes down 10%, we're still gonna be in the green for the year. Right. I just think it shows you right. that one, you can't try to time these, these market crashes and try to get in right at the floor. And if you would've just been holding through, even with a 10% crash, if it happens, you'd still be positive. And this is something that, w that we talk about a lot. The, the track record of individual investors being able to time the market, get out before it crashes, get back in for 
before it rallies, mm -hmm. makes makes slot machines in Vegas look attractive. Right. Right? I mean, no one can do it, can time it like that. And so what we also see is that when the market does crash historically, that's also when you have some of the market's best days. Mm -hmm. So you go back to late 2008 when the economy was falling apart and the stocks were crashing, you had some of the best days in the stock market in history during that period. And if people try to get out to avoid the downside, they almost invariably end up missing the upside. Mm -hmm. And so you know, in 2009, when the economy was still really bad, stocks went up 25% that year. So if you had tried to get out before that, a lot of people miss that upside. And in the end, by trying to tweak your portfolio, get out now, get in then, mm -hmm. they really just, just, just end up whittling their wealth away. Right, and I think the way you have to look at it, I know you've done some, some work on this, is don't try to time the market, but have your, your cash in your portfolio right available to take advantage of big market swings. So not necessarily keeping it all on the sideline and saying, now here's my chance to go 100% equities, 100% stocks, right. but keep an appropriate cash balance. And when those opportunities are there, you put some, put some money in the market and let it work. Right, when, 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 when you have some spare cash and the economy is freaking out and investors are panicking, mm -hmm. selling everything, that spare cash is your best friend. And right. that's when you're really gonna go in and get some great buys that you're really gonna appreciate five or 10 years down the road. All right, all right, moving on to our next segment, taking a little bit of a deeper dive in the world of treasuries. Very exciting, everyone is just celebrating that we're gonna talk about the world of treasuries here. And you pulled out a quote from, from a congressman that said, Wall Street cares about treasuries, they trade treasuries, but it has no impact on Main Street. Right. I'm, I'm taking you agree with that, right? I, I definitely <laughs> do not agree with that. I think U.S. treasuries are really the cornerstone of the global financial system, and they serve as collateral backing to nearly every financial asset out mm -hmm. there, whether it is mortgage-backed securities or banks holding treasuries on their balance sheet. They really are the, the, the center cornerstone of, mm -hmm. of the global financial system. And they are that cornerstone because people know that they are, they are quote unquote, risk-free assets, mm -hmm. that, that, that the US government is the best credit in the world and that they are effectively risk-free. Mm -hmm. If we call that into question in the next couple of weeks and miss an interest payment, well, that suddenly goes up in smoke. And there are really two issues here. One is the effect that has on confidence. You're gonna scare investors, they're not gonna know what to do. It could be like 2008 again, where it's not so much that you have really bad damage in the financial system, mm -hmm. it's just fear. And if no one knows who's holding what, where the losses are gonna come from, everything just seizes up and stops. And you get really serious economic damage at that point. So you think if, if the US was to default or whatever this technical term becomes, I'm sure we'll think of some word, if we do indeed miss a payment, you, you think the probabilities are high that that would cause some sort of panic. I think the probability is high. I think one thing we have going for us is that we have weeks talking about this. Mm -hmm. So if it did happen, it wouldn't be much of a surprise. Whereas 2008, uh, when Lehman Brothers went over, that went, went bankrupt, that surprised nearly everyone and took everyone off guard. Uh, but yeah, I think the odds are very high that that would be uh, devastating to the financial system. And one other thing to think about too is that even if people are not scared and worried, there are a lot of mutual funds and money market funds and banks and pension funds that in their internal bylaws mm -hmm. says that you need to hold X percent of your assets in X quality uh, security, like mm -hmm. treasuries. Well, if treasuries default and all of a sudden they don't qualify as that particular quality, you could have money market funds or pension funds that are forced to liquidate quickly. Mm -hmm. And that was another thing we saw in 2008, when you have funds that are forced to liquidate really fast. So right. I'm, I'm not things happen. I'm not going to disagree that there's potential for panic and for legal parameters in terms of, okay, what do mutual funds have to do? What happens to, to CDSs right. uh, against them? We're not going to get into all of that. But I think the main difference between now in 2008 when people are saying we're going to have a, a, something just like 2008, maybe worse. I don't think that's the case because one of the big problems in 2008 was all the mortgage securities and those as collateral as opposed to, to U.S. Treasuries. And when we look at the mortgage products that nobody knew what they w were worth because they didn't know the ability to pay them. People thought people are not going to pay their mortgages. These securities aren't worth anything. Right. I think we know the U.S. Treasury's ability to pay the debt, it's just a question of whether they're going to pay. So I think that in the market psychology, I'm certainly not gonna make a prediction that there's gonna be, it's gonna be all calm waters or there's gonna be a huge panic, yeah. but I think that's an important difference between people not being able to pay their mortgage and the US just saying, hey, we're not gonna pay it because of this political stalemate. No, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think uh, if, heaven forbid, there were a default, I think 
odds are it would be it would be a missed interest payment for a few days, mm -hmm. something like that. And we're actually seeing that in the mortgage in the treasury market right now, that treasury securities that are coming due in the next couple of weeks, yields are going up and up mm -hmm. and up and up because people are wondering whether they're going to get their money back on time for those right. treasuries. All right. Well, moving on to our next segment, we're going to play a game, lighten it up. I'm sure everyone just fell asleep from us <laughs> talking about treasuries. But we are going to play a round of fool in the blank. You've played this game before. It's when we give a scenario, and there is a blank, and you fool it in. So our first scenario of the day is, I am going to be blank to see Bernanke go. I'm going to be sad to see Bernanke go. You're sad. I think he uh, will go down in history as, I think, the guy who saved the 2008 financial crisis. I think it's very easy to point fingers at him right now about Fed policy, about QE and printing money. But I think history will look back and judge him as a, as, as a brave guy and probably the single best person to be manning the ship in 2008. I think what I think a lot about with 2008 is not what happened, but what could have happened. As mm -hmm. bad as it was, it's so easy to uh, think about how much worse it could have been if a few things had gone differently. Mm -hmm. And I think Ben Bernanke had that good, uh, uh, he, he had a, a, a good imagination mm -hmm. in 2008 to realize what things could have been. You know, his background in, uh, in, in academia was studying the Great Depression. Right. So I think he more than anyone knew what happens when you let the banking system go under. I'm going to almost completely agree with you. I'm going to throw in, I'm going to miss his beard as well. It's a great beard. I will he's miss rocking over there. doesn't have a full head of hair, but he's got a great beard. you got to respect that. I don't think we're going to see that from Janet Yellen. I hope not. I, I hope not, we're too. We're going to have some problems. Let's, let's keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. All right, moving on to the next scenario. Talking a little stocks here. Blank is one stock I own and don't think twice about during all of this noise. Fooling that blank. Well, a, a, a large part of my portfolio are, are, are market index funds. Mm -hmm. Right. So we should note that you're not a huge stock picker, but I, I, you do I, hold some. I, I, I certainly do pick, mm -hmm. pick stocks, but a large portion of my, of my portfolio are index funds. And this is when, uh, it's times like this, I think that index funds show their value when we really don't know what's going to happen to the banking sector, mm -hmm. what's going to happen to this sector, what's going to go on here. You own a little bit of everything. You're just owning a slice of the global economy. Uh, it makes sleeping easier at night for me. So you're going index funds. You're not even giving me a particular stock that you feel good about. Not, not right now. No. Okay. I'm gonna go. With, I'm gonna uh, go with Markel. Okay. I know it's. I know you hold, hold I own Markel. It. It's, and it's, I almost said Markel beforehand. So, so yeah. So uh, you look at Markel. Great insurance business. I think the insurance that they're writing is still gonna happen. If the government defaults, people are still gonna need their their yoga studios, their antique cars. Those are still gonna need insurance. So I think the business is gonna go on. The risk with Markel is that they invest a lot of that float, a lot of that equity in the equity market. So if the, if the stock market has a rough time, you could see some performance suffer at Markel. But I think you look at the management team, they've earned the respect from the market that they're going to work through different scenarios. They made it through 2008. I think they'd make it through this scenario. So I feel good about Markel going forward. I'm actually going to give you a different answer than my okay, first Okay, you're going to change your answer. Which stock do I, do I uh, feel worse about? Do I, do I like holding and, and don't worry about the noise? I think that my answer is all of them. I, wouldn't, okay. I would never sell a single stock based on something like this with the government shutdown. And I think most investors should hold that same mindset. There you go. All right, moving on to the last scenario of the day. Blank is one thing that gets a stock on my radar. So the few stocks that you own, what gets them there? What gets them on your mind? You know, as I learned investing years ago, I was taught in a value investor framework. Mm -hmm. And I, I still believe that that's a good framework to have. I've been sort of changing and changing my, my philosophies recently to really give more uh, emphasis on the quality of a business and the quality of brand names and moats and really high quality companies mm -hmm. like that and sort of the, the, those intangible benefits. So any company whose product I use that, I, that I'm really excited about mm -hmm. uh, are companies that I get excited about now. Whereas years ago, I was much more of a, let's dig into the numbers, let's mm -hmm. build a spreadsheet kind of guy. One company that's not public, but I hope it will be someday, uh, is Uber. Have you ever oh, used yes. Uber? It's amazing. So it's an, it's, app you, it's an app you can get on your phone mm -hmm. that basically hails a taxi, but instead of a taxi, it's a sparkling clean Lincoln Town right. Car or an Escalator mm -hmm. or whatnot. It charges everything to your credit card. It's not that expensive. It's completely blowing up the taxi space. Mm -hmm. so that's an example of a company where it's like, I, I don't know what their numbers are like. They're not public. And I don't think they're going to go public mm -hmm. anytime soon, but it's like, I love this company. Right. It makes my life easier. I'm ecstatic about it. I'm telling all my friends about it. Th those are the kind of companies that get me excited. All right, I'm going to go with management's clarity. Uh, whether it be in a, a presentation, a conference call, 
the annual report, if there's a, a company and I, I read their annual report or listen to the most recent conference call and I can actually understand the business the first time I'm listening to it from the CEO, he can, can clearly articulate the business over the next five years, kind of their long-term vision. That's what gets on my radar. There's so many businesses out there that if you, you listen to their calls or read their annual reports, you just say, what business is this? I, I can't even understand what their vision is. But if you have a business that it's very clear what they want to do over the, over the next five years, that's what gets on my radar. And the one that was recently on my radar and re a recent addition to my portfolio is PNC, the bank. And if you listen to their conference calls or their presentations, the CEO, William Demchek, he just gets it. And that's, it's a very intangible asset to have, but if you just have a leader that gets the business, understands where they want to be, that's what gets it on my radar. So many CEOs that can't articulate their business visions probably because they don't have one. Exactly. It's, it's not communication, it's <laughs> actual thinking. Right. <laughs> All right, moving on to the final segment on the Twitter sphere, closing it out with our first tweet here. It's about Buffett from Shane Parrish at Farm Street. It's a terrible mistake to think you have to have an opinion on everything. That is, of course, from Warren Buffett. Do you have an opinion on everything? I don't. I have an opinion on very, very few things. And I think uh, the way the media works today with Twitter as we, where we got that from and the 24-7 the news cycle, analysts and journalists and pundits are expected to have immediate reaction analysis to mm -hmm. everything, regardless of how trivial the news is. And I, I just think that does a big disservice to viewers and mm -hmm. readers. I think it's not only okay, but... Uh, it's a good thing to say, I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. have enough information on this. It's not, it's not relevant to me. It's not valid to me. Mm -hmm. There is so much more news today than there was 20 years ago. So I always talk about like 20 years ago, you had the Wall Street Journal, you had Louis Roy Kaiser, and that was pretty much it. Mm -hmm. You had some, some obscure newsletters, but today you have CNBC and Business Insider and Twitter and CNN Money, and there's so many different mm -hmm. news outlets. But what's changed in the last 20 years is not the volume of meaningful stuff going on in the world. It's just the volume of news coming mm -hmm. out of it. So because of that, you really need to push a lot of it to the yeah, side. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we mentioned, what's important. we mentioned Janet Yellen at the beginning of the show, but before we started filming, I said, I wish we, I mean, we have to mention it because it's news, but I wish, I don't want to have an opinion on it. It's kind right. of, I, I'm, she's a, she's a smart woman. She has great experience. It's, that's my opinion. I mean, I don't, I don't think she, it's good or bad. And my analysis is let's see what happens. We really right. don't know what's going to happen yet. Exactly. All right, so. moving on to the next tweet we've got. It's about some hedge funds from Stanley Pignall. He says, 95% of hedge funds have underperformed the S&P 500 so far this year. Source, Goldman Sachs. Interesting. Not it's, that surprising either to me. Not that I surprising. Think the one rebuttal here could be that not every hedge fund should be benchmarked right. to the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. But it's a pretty good benchmark. And we know that a lot of them should basically be benchmarked to the S&P. The fact that so many are underperforming shows, I think, two things. Uh, one is that, I, 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 I think I mentioned this in a show several weeks ago, there are now more Taco Bells in the United <laughs> States than there are hedge funds. Mm -hmm. It's just a very, very crowded space. Whereas 30 years ago, there were they were two or three hundred, mm -hmm. and back then you could really exploit opportunities if you were a good professional investor, and you could really go out and earn some good returns. There's so much competition in the space now that hedge funds just really have a hard time generating good returns. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, the fees that they that they charge are just outrageous. Right. So the standard hedge fund fee is two percent of assets plus twenty percent of the profits. There are some top-notch hedge funds that can get that can Absolutely. that that can earn that. But when that just goes down the chain and every hedge fund, regardless of performance, is charging that, you just get terrible returns. Right. So, where, so where, where do these profits come out of? Well, the biggest investors in hedge funds are pension funds, 401k, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it, it's really coming out of, of people's pockets, right. going straight into hedge fund managers. I mean, it's, it's easy to kick the hedge funds when, when they're down. And I'm certainly not advocating people to go out and put, put their money in just any old hedge fund. But I think it also highlights that we've heard so many smart money people saying, I have so much cash on the sideline. I think that's probably the biggest drag of performance. It's not the fact that they're going out and, and investing in JCPenney and right. <laughs> losing all their money. I think it's the fact that they have cash wh where the market is up, what, 16% this year. Right. And you have a lot of cash on the sidelines, that can hold it back. So I'm not gonna, not gonna say they're all bad, but I think if we did have a market downturn, that's when you could potentially see them some outperform. Obviously, since my, there's so many. My, my rebuttal is that in 2008, when we did have a big they downturn, they, the, 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 the hedge funds, whose job it was to hedge. manage risk and hedge, did not hedge. A lot of them, most of them lost a tremendous amount. I'm trying to defend the billionaires, Morgan. Come on. <laughs> they, need, they need a break here. All right, moving on to the final tweet 
from Josh Brown. He says, every year I learn to pay attention to less things. It costs me nothing. Less so, things, is, is that the way to go? It's actually fewer things. Some of people pointed that out to Josh, but oh. we'll give him a pass. <laughs> uh, and th this sort of goes back to the tweet that we, that we were talking about with news. It's really, there's so much information out there, mm -hmm. and you don't need to feel that you need to soak all of it up. I, th I think the most important thing you can do if you're reading financial news is figure out what to tune, to tune out and what mm -hmm. not to pay attention to. Just because someone wrote a news article about something or has an opinion about something does not mean it's relevant to you. Mm -hmm. There's a great quote by, uh, by an old economist. Uh, he says, pundits forecast not because they know, but because they are asked. Right. And I, I think that just sums up so much of the media today. Well, I am not going to ask you to forecast anymore. <laughs> That's our show for today. I will be back here tomorrow with Stock Advisor Analyst Brendan Matthews. We'll be talking some insurance, some Berkshire, and some more. We'll see you then.